Good morning and welcome to the Eden United Methodist Sunday, December 11th church service. On this third Sunday of Advent, we are both in person and live streaming. So welcome to everyone. My name is Lucinda Karstedt and I will be the worship leader today. I'm joined by Dave Gronsky, our choir director, our wonderful choir, along with our pastor, Kate Nickel. I, before we get started with our service today, I do have a few announcements. Um, they are mostly in your bulletin for those of you here in person, but in case you're watching us online, I'll try to go through the uh, highlighted ones that are mostly happening this week. Um, if you have this center section, those of you here, we have, um, well, actually, I just said that on Thursday, December 22nd at 7 p.m., we have our longest night Christmas service for those, it's called the Blue Christmas service for those who are grieving and struggling to experience the joy of the season. But we also have our Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. on the 24th and our Christmas Day service at 11 a.m. on the 25th. One that is not in the bulletin that I do want to highlight is we've been donating to ha Haven, ha Haven House, sorry, Haven House donations. Um, they are still accepting donations here at our church until the 14th. Um, underwear for everyone is greatly needed, especially women's. Um, if you are going to stop by during the week to drop something off in the narthex, please call ahead. Um, Christmas flowers are, this is the last day to order them. A sign-up sheet is in the narthex. Um, the second Sunday soup is today after church, although I've seen Nancy out there before church, so if you want to get ahead and get your favorite soup, I think a few of you already grabbed it. Um, the Bible study, the, the small groups, uh, my session is tonight, and it does say 5.30, but we've moved it to 6 p.m. tonight at my house, and Carol is 6.30 p.m. Where are you meeting, Carol? In the church kitchen. In the church kitchen. And a uh, new group with uh, Thursdays with Beth, and Beth, where is your group meeting? Somewhere in the Sunday school room. Okay, so again, you can see that we all have ask us about it. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us, Beth, Carol, or myself, and also Pastor Kate. All right, so um, a couple other things that I wanted to point out on the calendar this week. On Tuesday, we have a worship meeting at 11 a.m. At 7 p.m., there's an SPPRC meeting. And next Saturday, we will be celebrating the life of Nancy Sheffer at 11 a.m. here. I think I got everything, didn't I, Mr. Kate? Okay. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Okay. Then if you could join me in our first hymn, and it's stand if you are able. It's in the blue book. It's called Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. It's number 213 in this hymnal. Stay standing and join me in the opening prayer. Stir up your power, O Lord, Lord and with, with great, great might come, come among us. And, and because, because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So we're actually having a gathering after worship today because Jim is retiring, retiring. <laughs> and you all went which Jim, didn't you? Because there are a couple of names in this church that are on repeat. Jim is one of them. Nancy's one of them. But I'm talking about Pastor Jim Hankey. He is officially retiring at the end of this month. And so we are going to celebrate in the fellowship hall following worship. Now, does anybody remember where the fellowship hall is? It's been a little bit, but it's that way when you walk out the sanctuary door. So I, I want to encourage you to stick around, not only to buy soup for the UMW, but, but also so that we can celebrate Jim. And I, I'm going to say this one thing. It has been a joy to work with Jim. He loves teaching studies, so look forward to announcements where he is going to continue to lead some of those things. But he is letting go of some of those, yes, he's letting go of some of those other responsibilities. But I also want to give thanks to Andra. Because... Because we all know that when you've been married as long as the two of them, how long has it been? I was going to say, we did a big celebration recently. That's what I thought. 61 years. Oh my God. Andrew, you're a saint. <laughs> Jim, you're a saint. <laughs> I just had to, I had to go equal, okay? <laughs> that it's a partnership to be able to do these things. And so we give thanks for Andrew's support of Jim's ministry. We can all give, let's give a, a final round of applause. I know we did a couple little ones. Do I have to make an announcement to get the children up here? Anybody else want to join? Should we invite anybody else up? Sure. Well, we can invite everybody up, but I really don't think they're going to go, go for the, this. Watch. See, because as you get older, this gets harder, and that is the truth. Oh, yeah. I'm getting up. Getting up is worse, isn't it? So I have a question for you guys. What were you doing this morning in the sanctuary? What? Rehearsing for, Rehearsing for your Christmas pageant. And when are we going to show them what wonderful actors you all are? Next 
Next Sunday, okay. Do you know when? During the, in church, that's right, during the worship service. So after we celebrate Nancy Sheffer's life on Saturday, we're going to do a quick refit of the sanctuary, and it shall become, what's the name of the town? Bethlehem, that's right, because that is where the story of Jesus' birth takes place. Now, we talked a little bit about Bethlehem today in Sunday school. Garrett, do you remember that Bible passage I pulled out from the Old Testament? Do you remember the name? What? To some degree. Do you remember the name of the prophet? Micah, Micah, that's right. And do you remember the chapter? It's okay if you don't. It's Micah 5, and then do you know what verse it was? Because, wow, his memory still works. Whew, I would have had trouble with that. So, uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Do, do, do you guys remember at all what it, what it said? You don't have to remember word for word, but what? It said that, like, God um, can't look back at you too much in it. Oh, that's our verse for practicing how to breathe out properly to support our... It started with Bethlehem. Yeah, it's Bethlehem. Yeah. It... That's right. It says Bethlehem of Ephrathath, and no, I don't know who Ephrathath is or what that is, but that's what it says. You, of, you Bethlehem of Ephrathath, the smallest of places, will become significant and important one day. Now, Spencer said, what was it again? Like God can't be distracted. How does it go, Miss Kathy? God can't be... Nothing is impossible with God is the one that we're working on in the Sunday school as a breathing exercise, right? So if God can work through a little town like Bethlehem, then he can work through us whether we're this size or we're one of them out there, right? Because God has the power to do that, and he shows us some of that in terms of where Jesus is born, and that's what we're going to talk about the rest of the, for the service. Now, how does that verse go again? God can do, help me out, man. For their, what is it, Kathy? Seriously? There's nothing God cannot do, huh? That sounds about right, but what are we, we're supposed to do this, ready? We're supposed to sit up straight, right? Breathe in. Everybody? You're practicing your good formal speaking voice? Okay, you're going to have to lead us, Garrett, because I'm going to stumble. Ready? Set? Murmur, murmur, murmur. All three of you, all three of you, ready? Deep breath in. For there is nothing God cannot do. What was that again? One more time. For there is nothing God cannot do. Now remember, when we're doing the play next week, we are going to open our mouths and enunciate our words, right? And we're not going to talk like the Muppets. Now you have to go find out what that is, because Garrett doesn't know that particular... Yeah, but you don't know the murmur, murmur, murmur mur, uh, particular references. This is it's an actual Muppet. So we're going to practice saying it one last time. And I'm going to see if you actually open your mouth, Garrett. Oh, they're saying no. Gosh. Okay, can you help me out then? There is nothing God cannot do. I'm looking at you. Ready? There is nothing God cannot do. So that's your final reminder for the invitation to next week's worship as we celebrate both the Sunday school and the Christmas pageant, as well as we're actually going to talk about Mary next week. So let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for these children. We pray as they continue to grow in faith that we do as well, that we would be able to share with them what it means to be loved and forgiven by you. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I'm going to read a verse that we don't actually have in the bulletin, and that is that that verse from Micah that uh, we talked about in Sunday school, and none of that was 
planned, and I kept interrupting, and I'm thankful that Mrs. Jeffers can handle uh, children who interrupt her constantly, even if they're the pastor. So we're going to look at Micah 5. Anybody know where Micah is? You do? Oh, can you help me? I found it. It's those minor prophets, and they're so thin, they just have a couple pages that you just have to go really carefully when you hit them. But it's always after Daniel and Hosea and Amos, because those are the long minor prophets. Micah's not a long one. All right, Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem of Ephrathath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Did you catch all of that? Whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So our sermon today is supposed to focus on Luke, so we're going to go back to that. Luke chapter 2, which we also talked about in the uh, Sunday school class. And I didn't have it marked, but I know my New Testament order. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Can you do it that fast? Luke chapter 2 verses, it is Luke, it is actually Luke, isn't it? Let's see. I know what it says in there, but I know that's not right. Because we're supposed to be talking about the birth of Jesus. Does anybody know where the birth of Jesus happens in Matthew? This is why I know that it's not Matthew. Really? Really? Did you guys do what I told you to do last week? Go look at, the, go look at Matthew chapter 1. What happens in Matthew chapter 1? The genealogy of Jesus, yeah? And then, the, and then um, whatchamacallit, you know, that guy, Herod, he shows up. Joseph learns that, Jesus, that, that Mary's going to have Jesus. And in Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for that is what the prophet has written. But see even though that says four through six there, and I'm looking at it going, huh, I'm reading Luke. Because I'm allowed to do that. And I'm not reading four through six, which should have been the clue in. When he had called together all the people, that's Matthew. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's Matthew too. Yep. Yep. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for that is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will prepare, who will shepherd my people Israel. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, may our hearts and minds be open to what you would have us learn this day that we would grow in your grace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the story continues on from there in Matthew, which is the only place that this particular event occurs. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search. If you know the story of the Magi, then you also know that they don't go to Bethlehem first. They go to Jerusalem. And they go to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the center. It is where the rulers are. So when they heard the story that someone was to be born, they didn't remember that verse from Micah. They went to Jerusalem because it was the place everybody went. Now, one of the things that um, as I was, whether or not I got the, the gospel right, the piece I do remember is this, that in the root study we're talking about this week, we're talking about place, the place where Jesus comes from. And I can remember very early in my ministry, uh, I got to that text, the text uh, from either Matthew or Luke, where it talks about Bethlehem. And I talked about the city itself. I've had the fortune of being able to go to Bethlehem more than once. And the first time I went was just before one of the uprisings. And then it was shut down for a while. And you may recall, because this was a really long time ago at this point, it was in 2000, you may recall that the, that the Church of the Nativity was taken over. Does anybody remember a story about that? The Church of the Nativity being taken over by folks who were fighting Israel 
and what they would call the occupation of Israel, of their homeland. And I had the opportunity to be able to go into that church, and I couldn't believe that they would go into the space there, because if you ever get the chance to go over there, the, most of the churches have their original building, and then they have the new one that they built that they use now. So when I was over there that, the, in 2000, the part, the oldest part of the church was actually not open. It was closed for renovations. It's still under renovation today. But Bethlehem in the time of Jesus was nothing like Bethlehem is today because Bethlehem today is actually a relatively large city. Now, if you're aware of all the stuff that's going on in Israel, between Israel and, and the Palestinians, you may know that Bethlehem is actually completely surrounded by a wall. Did you know that? You can go look that up, by the way. <laughs> I would encourage you to do so so that you can see what it's actually like. There are actually a series of Christian songs that are sung as they walk next to the wall to highlight this division that has been created by Israel between Bethlehem and the rest of the area. Yes, that is actually a pretty difficult and complicated subject, but it highlights how significant Bethlehem is, and yet we still don't necessarily know what's going on. We don't know what's going on over there. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was what I would often refer to as a podunk town. Not even a town, a village. It was a tiny little place of no consequence. In the Lyft program, we took out those maps that are in your Bibles. Have you ever looked at those maps in your Bibles? And, in the map, and on that map, we had the kids look at where Nazareth was and where Bethlehem was, because as the story tells us from Luke and both Matthew, that, that the reason they're going to Bethlehem is because there's a census to be taken. That's actually only in Luke. There's a census to be taken. And, and they are to go back and deal with taxes and a census that's to be taken, and they have to go back to the place of origin. Well, that happened to be Bethlehem for Joseph. Does anybody have any idea how far apart Nazareth and Bethlehem are? See, Nazareth is in the north, and Bethlehem is in the south. Yeah, you guys said like 70. So then I told the story like this, because I went to Nazareth the last time that I went to Israel, which was in 2014. I went to Nazareth, and I hadn't been there before, and then we were on a bus for like four hours. And we were on a bus for like four hours to get to Bethlehem because of that wall. It used to be a lot simpler to be able to go through, but because of the wall and the additional security barriers, we had to drive an extra distance. And I still remember that moment sitting on the bus, because when I went to Bethlehem the first time around, that wall wasn't there. When I went to Bethlehem that second time around, and I saw it, and I saw how close people's houses were, that I thought, how can this be the place of Jesus' birth? He's the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace. And yet here in this place of his birth, there is complete and utter division. Now, what I also happen to know is that Bethlehem is the place where the majority of the Christian population is left in the West Bank. Most of the Palestinian Christians have left because there's not much economic opportunity there. I say all these things to say that Bethlehem was a place that was difficult to come from. Bethlehem was a small place. Bethlehem today isn't a small place, but it is a difficult place to come from. And somehow God chose Bethlehem as the place where he would come into the world, in the incarnation. Now, I'm from the city of Rochester. And it said in the examples, give examples of, if you're from a small town, talk all about it. And I said, well, I live in a small town. I keep filling out all those profiles we fill out for, for pastors. You know how you guys fill out a profile? You may not know this, but you, as a Methodist church, you fill out a profile that says who you are when you need a new pastor and what you're looking for in that pastor. And the pastors fill out the same form. Guess what I put every time I fill it out? I'm a city girl. I've had one urban church. One. In the smallest city. 
It wasn't that small, but it was small by, by, by Rochester standards. It was only a population of 70,000, and Rochester's just over 200,000. I think it's less than that these days. But that, that's where I came from, and I, and I came from a residential neighborhood in Rochester. I didn't come from like where there's lots of, lots of stuff going on. Well, there was lots of stuff going on, but not the kind of stuff that you find in the country. And I can remember when they sent me to my first church, it was in a town about the same size as this one. It was called, I'm not saying a bad word, Athol, Massachusetts. And I can remember as I put things together for that particular advent that I, I, I began to understand what it meant for someone to come from a place, a small place, a place no one knows about. I mean, it, it says of low degree in scripture, Jesus doesn't come from the highest of families in the line of King David. He comes from Joseph. And, and Joseph had to be told in a dream by an angel that he was going to be the father of the God. Otherwise, he was like, I'm leaving Mary behind because that kid's not my kid because we haven't gotten properly married yet. That's how I'll put it. And yet, here's Jesus. Now, that image that we have of Jesus being born in a manger, can you picture that? It's a barn. We even say barn in the, in the Christmas pageant, just so you know. Jesus wasn't born in a barn. They didn't do barns like we do barns, because I know when you say barn around here, you have an image of what a barn looks like, right? That's not what it was. And if you say stable, you have an image of what a stable actually looks like, because you know, and I had to learn all this stuff. Because no, in the city we did not have stables, we did not have barns or silos or any of that stuff. We did not have tractors riding down the main road. It did not smell like manure. I'm not saying it smelled good, but it didn't smell like manure. It was a different kind of place. Jesus wasn't born in the kind of country, in the kind of small town when we think about those things, especially if we think of them as Eden. He was born in a place where there probably were only a few households, and the better translation, honestly, isn't that, that there was an inn that he went to, but that there, were no, there was no room in the guest room because it was Middle Eastern custom that you provided space within your own home for those who are traveling. And when Joseph arrived at a house and said, hey, is there room in there? And they said, there's no space in the guest area. They didn't then send them out back to a barn. It's most likely, and you can look this up, that it was actually a cave, and that there was a section of the cave that was where the family lived, and then a section where they put the animals at night to protect them. If you ever get the chance to go to the West Bank, there are people who still live in caves today. But, but this was the circumstance that the Lord God became flesh in. And there wasn't a nice fresh bed to lay him in, right? Because when we think bed, we think, what, we think a crib maybe? A bassinet for a brand, a brand new baby? What, what comes to mind? Because that's not what Jesus was born into. He, he was born into a place and a time where they wouldn't have had those kinds of things. He was born into a place and a time in which, hopefully, he would have been able to lay down on a straw mat, but instead he was put in a manger, now, when we say manger, we have an idea of what that looks like too, don't we? But that's not what it means either. The manger is a feeding trough. Now, because we're in farm country, I know I don't have to go look up what a feeding trough is. I can just tell you, picture it. Am I right? Am I, did I, you know what a feeding trough is? Okay, good, because I didn't go look it up. I know what it is, though. But I didn't go look it up this time. And he was placed in that feeding trough because that was the only place to lay our Savior, the God of, of our salvation, down. And I can remember in my first, very first sermon as I talked about Bethlehem that I said to the people who were gathered in the congregation that that, that means that God came into a place like Eden instead of Buffalo or Rochester or New York. I skipped Syracuse, sorry. But, though, but God wasn't born in those big places. God was born in an insignificant place, 
a place where not that many people lived. And not only was God born in a place where not that many people live, God was born without a home. God, our God, was born without a place to rest his head. Now think of what Jesus goes on to do from there. They go back to Nazareth, and he grows up. He speaks in the synagogues. He begins to share with the world and reveal to them who he really is. God chose a place that had no significance. That had no significance to enter into the world. God chose a place that was so small people didn't really know about it. God chose the least, the smallest, the dirtiest, the uh oh, wait. Doesn't say that, does it? What it does say is that God chose an unexpected place and a person of low birth, a person that didn't matter to the rest of the world to be the mother of God. God chose to work in these places that we would not expect because when we think, just like the Magi did, that God is going to come to a place like Jerusalem, God doesn't go to Jerusalem, God goes to Bethlehem. House of bread, that's what it means. God goes to Bethlehem. So when we look in the mirror and we say to ourselves, well, I'm too old for this or my body can't get up and down. I was thinking about the day when I'm not going to be able to get up and down from these stairs as I got up this time. But it doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter where we've come from. It doesn't matter if we grew up in the church or we came into the church later on. None of that matters. What matters is that we understand that God works in and through each and every one of us when we recognize what God has done in Jesus Christ. And so if we ever look at ourselves and say, I'm not enough, I don't come from a, a, an important enough place or family, the very story of our, our Lord's birth tells us that none of that matters. Because our God has a way of taking the expectations of the world and the way we think things ought to be and turning it on its head and showing us that God works through as he says throughout scripture, the least of these, those of low birth, those who don't have what they need. How many times does Jesus say the rich will be sent empty and away, but the poor will have a place? Now, that used to be interpreted as I'm going to go and I'm going to become poor so that I understand what God is talking about, but I don't think that's what God intended for us either. I think what God wants us to understand is that we are exactly who he needs to speak and show to the world God's glory, God's light, and God's love. That we don't need to be all those special, specific things. No, he just needs you and me. Because as he showed us through the birth of Christ, he can work through and utilize anyone, any place. So when you wake up and you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning, instead of, well, that's an interesting way my hair went, right, <laughs> from sleeping, or, oh, look at the wrinkles, I don't know what you say. I actually, I, I don't say any of those things. I go, oh, I'll brush your hair. You probably should brush your teeth, too. That's what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm a very functional, and like, just everything has a purpose and a function kind of thing. But every once in a while, I need that reminder when I look in the mirror to say that God has the ability to work through even me. Not only does God have the ability to work in and through me, but God has called us into this relationship with him where he calls us to be his hands and feet at work in this world, where he calls us to be his light, where he calls us to be the reflections of his glory at work in this world. And he chooses to do that through whoever responds, but he chooses to do that regardless of where we come from or who we were before. Because what matters to God is that moment in which we enter into right relationship with him and we yield ourselves so that God can work in and through us. So I got asked a question before worship. And I, my response before the question was even asked was, you're going to ask me a complicated question before worship. Don't ask the pastor a complicated question before worship. 
Notice how I couldn't even remember what the scripture passage was. I'm not blaming you, Henry. I'm just kidding. (laughs) That was just my own. It's been a busy, tiring week. I'm here, though. And that question was, what's going on in the United Methodist Church? Awful, horrible, it's a mess. If you've wondered, in our denomination, it's a mess. We are approaching an actual, real-world schism, break from each other. Now, I hope that as I've preached over the last couple of years here, that you have heard this from me. Our call is to be God's hands and feet of love at work in this world. Our call is to reflect the glory of God. That is our call. And then beyond that, God calls us to be his peacemakers and set an example of how to live with one another when we disagree. So do you think we're doing a good job if the denomination is breaking apart? No. But how many of you were aware that the denomination was breaking apart? Seriously, I kind of want to know. How many of you were aware the denomination was breaking apart? Okay. And how many of you think it's about one issue? It's way more complex than that because it always is. I am aware that we need to make some decisions on those things. I know that they are going on. But I also know that the thing that matters more than anything else is that God has called us to be his hands and feet and words of love. God has called us to be the people who reflect his glory. Can we find a way to have whatever conversation it is that we need to have so that no matter what occurs, we can be God's hands and feet, God's words of love at work in this world, and not be torn apart, and not be torn apart by personal opinions, interpretations, and things like that, because I believe that you have gotten this far, and you have lived together this long, and you know who doesn't agree with you. You probably know better than I do who's a Democrat and who's a Republican. I don't care. I care about that relationship that you have with God and that you recognize that God can work through you and that God will work through this messy, messed up, I don't want to do it, don't want to deal with it situation that we're in. That's right. Because I believe with every fiber of my being that our call as Christians is to be God's hands and feet and words of love at work in this world. And no matter who we are or where we come from, God has the ability to do just that. So let's show the people who are pushing through this split, what it means to actually be unified in Christ. What I will say is I have no idea what the outcome is. Because you know what? There are no prophecies about this. There's no Micah predicting this. There's no Isaiah saying the suffering servant is coming. There's none of that. It does predict that Scripture predicts over and over again that we will find a way to disagree with one another and do it so badly that we will pull ourselves away from our relationship with God and thus pull everyone else around us away from God. It does say we'll do that. No amen? So we're here. We're getting ready to celebrate the incarnation, to celebrate Jim's retirement. I think that he might be retiring just so he doesn't have to do this. Because what I've been saying all along individually is this. Oh my goodness, we just finished this pandemic thing and that was enough of a headache and I really don't want to have to ever go back and do that again. And now they're like, make a choice. And I'm like, have you been to the church in Eden? We know how to live together. We 
We know how to be God's hands and feet and words of love at work in this community together, regardless of whether or not we hold particular political beliefs, regardless of whether or not we agree on sexuality, regardless of whether or not about a million things, but the thing that matters most is that if we are in right relationship with God, then he has forgiven us and then sent us out to be his hands and feet and his words of love at work in this world. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kate. Um, if you are able, could you please stand and join me in our second hymn, You Are My All in All, which is not in our hymnal, so it will be projected on the wall. Thank you. It's in the... I don't think everyone has the green one, so. in the blue hymnal. Or you can say it the way you memorized it, but we're <laughs> going to do 882 because I'm young enough that this is the one I memorized. Okay. I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, creator, creator of heaven, heaven and earth. earth. I, I believe in Jesus, Jesus Christ, his, his only, only Son, our, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, died, and was buried. buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I'm going to invite us into a time of prayer with God and with each other. Let us uh, celebrate once more Jim Hankey's retirement, re-retirement, not really retirement because you never stop being a Christian. And God has called us, I think, I think I said this, did I say this? To be God's hands and feet and words of love at work in this world. And we don't need a credential to do it because look at how Jesus came in to this world. Amen? Amen. So let us gather together in prayer with God and with each other. We will be celebrating Nancy Sheffer's life this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. Let us keep her family and others in prayer. And I encourage you to lift up whatever God has placed on your hearts. If it is a concern, end with Lord in your mercy and we'll say, hear our prayer. If it is a joy, Lord, for, our blessings, for your blessings, hear our praise. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, as we gather in this time of prayer with you and with each other, we are grateful for how much you have loved us. 
that you are able to look past all the things that we do wrong and you love us completely in spite of all of it. And then you call us to be your hands and feet at work in this world. God, help us in those moments when we don't trust that you are working in and through us. Those moments when we doubt ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, I'd like to lift up my little grandson, Gray, who is currently spiking high fevers and under doctor's watch. Please make his fever uh, go down soon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. Hear our prayer. God, we do lift up nurses and doctors who are providing for children at this time. God, we pray that you would grant them your strength, that they would continue to be able to provide care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for the ministry of Jim Henke not just for his time here in this congregation, but in the places he has served. Lord, for your blessings, hear our praise. Lord, may we always seek what it means to be loved and forgiven by you. May we learn to trust you more fully. God, we pray that as you continue to walk with us and enable us to be your witnesses, your light in the darkness in this world, that we would learn new ways, more peaceful ways to express our differences. And may we never forget that you died for each of us, all of us. And may we always see that whoever it is we are speaking with, whether or not we agree with them, that you died for them too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for the end of war in our world. We specifically lift up the Ukraine. We pray for your lasting peace to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we give you thanks for the ability to gather together to worship you, to honor Jim and the service he has given to the church. We pray that you would continue to work in and through each of us. We ask all of this through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and pray as he taught us to. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. We're coming to the time in our service where we are able to give back a little bit of what God has generously given to us. Um, the ushers will be coming forward for the people in church, but there's also some additional ways that you can be give, giving to the church and to God's works um, that will be on the screen. Thank you.
Generous God, as we bring our gifts to you this day, we acknowledge that we have been given so much by your goodness, but we have been tight-fisted. In this Advent season of preparation, we ask you to help us live in a new way, to walk a new highway, to set ourselves on a path that leads to a closer walk with Jesus by our example, or his example, and our Redeemer. May this be the season when he finds the highways to our hearts prepared for his coming, and the name that is above all others, Amen. Please join us in the third hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, number 230, in the large blue hymnal. Thank you. God has called us to be his hands and feet and words of love. He has called each of us to be his hands and feet and words of love. To reflect the glory of God that is at work in us, transforming us, making us more like him. Trust that God is at work in you. And go into this world in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grab the hand of the person next to you if you're comfortable with it, and we will join in singing. Shalom. Mm -hmm. 